So welcome. Uh, I hope that your discussion groups went well. Um, and before we get into chapter three, chapter three is a short chapter, right? I don't know if you noticed that, but um, we're going to get longer chapters, especially as we get into the Sermon on the Mount and chapter five. Chapter three is a short chapter, and unfortunately, we're not going to get all the way through it tonight in my lecture. Um, it is jam-packed full of imagery and things I want to point out to you. Make sure you don't uh, skip over uh, and miss along the way. But before we get to chapter three, what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time reviewing where we've been, okay? So whether you've been here every week or not, let's just take a few minutes to recap that foundation that Matthew, the author, has set up for us because it's a foundation that the rest of the gospel will be seated upon, okay? And we do a really good job in our churches today, uh, not just not our church, but every other church does a really good job, right, of studying the Bible bit by bit. And we can dive into a small bit of scripture and we can unearth things there that are hidden treasures and um, truths that God intends for us to get. But what happens when you do bit by bit is you don't get the advantage of sometimes seeing the whole picture. And so what I don't want to have happen is for us to forget the premise that we started on, okay? So let's go back, Matthew chapter one. And I'm just gonna verbally take you through. If you wanna flip back in your Bibles, that'd be great too. Uh, the author takes us on a trip back through the kingly line of the promised Messiah, right? In the genealogy. He reminds us that it's not just the Jewish nation that has contributed to this story. Do you remember that? It wasn't just the Jews that were in that kingly line, that genealogy. That was surprising. Uh, there's Jews, there's Gentiles alike. There are righteous and there is dysfunction, right? And it's all included in there. Uh, there were saints and sinners, even stories of sexual controversy. Remember those? Yeah. That's important because the birth of the Messiah will be shrouded in sexual controversy as well. So Matthew finishes the genealogy with, if you remember, that last statement of 14, 14, and 14 generations. And the way we talked about it was the first set of 14 generations outlined the work of God and the creating of his nation, right? Abraham, Moses bringing out of slavery, the temple or the land being conquered, the temple being built, the work of God creating his nation. The second set of generations, the second set of 14, show the work of sin undoing all of that work. If you remember right, temples destroyed, people removed from the land, they go back into slavery and they go back to where Abraham started in the east, okay? So God builds a people and a nation, sin destroys that people and nation. And then the third set is uh, a highlight of the expectation of Christ to fix that problem, okay? Um, he will, and this is uh, kind of an interesting way to look at it. He will reestablish God's people. He will bring them out of slavery. He will take them to a new promised land. He will build a new temple and his people will last forever. His kingdom will last forever. Okay, that's the expectation coming out of the genealogy. Um, and then last week, we talked about the birth narrative. Remember that? We kind of covered the last part of chapter one as we went in, and we talked about the arrival of the Christ. And Matthew tells the story in terms of Old Testament ideas and stories. So I propose to you um, that Matthew is giving the reader a clue as to the spiritual condition of Israel at the time of Christ's arrival. And how is he doing that? He is saying things like, um, uh, giving, he's giving Jesus characteristics like the Moses character, right? He's a baby that's born, but he, <coughs> people wanna kill the baby boys. Refers back to the Moses character. Uh, place of bondage for true followers. That's, he's born into Israel, but Israel is spiritually the new what? Egypt, right? Jesus is actually escaping Israel 
and going to the safety of Egypt, which is the old switch. <laughs> somebody, somebody, you're going to get tired of that. Um, a uh, place of bondage for true followers is this, um, the true followers of God is Israel. Herod is the new what? Herod in Jesus' day is the new Pharaoh, okay? He's fulfilling that role. Uh, i give you something else to think about here. The religious leadership of Jesus' day are the new taskmaster masters out of the story of Egypt. Now, let me point this out to you. I'm going to pull up. Uh, Exodus chapter 5 on the screen, um, verse 6. And let me just read through this. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks, which they are making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it because they are lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men. Let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to false words. Whose false words? Moses' Moses's false words. And what was Moses saying? Moses was saying, let's go out to the desert, desert the wilderness, and worship our God. And Pharaoh is saying... No, you have work to do. In fact, you have more work to do. Now, just reading that in context, knowing the literary way that I have read through this story last week, does that sound familiar at all in the Jesus story? The religious leaders of Jesus' day, in fact, Matthew 23, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. The taskmasters of Jesus' day are the religious leadership. They're filling a character role within the story that Matthew is painting. Okay, we haven't gotten there yet, but we will. That's in chapter 23. Uh, Luke 11:46 also mentions that it's a, a comment that the lawyers say because they feel really insulted because <laughs> Jesus is lumping them in with a bunch of other people. And he says, woe to you lawyers as well. You weigh men down with burdens hard to bear while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Right? This is what the leadership of Jesus Day is doing. They are giving more work to do Spiritually speaking, right? Do this, do that. You have to act this way. You have to fill this. And they were just trying to prevent the true worshipers of God from listening to the words of the new Moses. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I thought that was interesting um, when I first saw that. Christ is born into a spiritually, we're still in review here, right? Don't forget where we're at. Christ is born into a spiritually very dark situation. Okay? This is the foundation. It's just not a bad situation. It's unlike any other period in time in Israel's history. And if you know Israel's history, that's saying a lot. Because Israel had some bad times. But when Christ shows up, that generation that he was born into, he makes comments I don't know uh, if you remember, um, he makes comments about uh, this generation and brings woes on this generation. He does it five times in Matthew's gospel alone. And we'll review some of those things. Um, in fact, let's take a look at one right now in Matthew 11. And you, Capernaum, you, you're going to recognize this as soon as I start uh, pointing it out. And you, Capernaum, you will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles that had occurred in had occurred in Sodom and uh, which occurred to you, it would have remained to this day. Now, do we need to go back and review the story of Sodom, right? A city that was completely destroyed, and um, there's actually a, a sexual act that's named after the city. How I mean, how many cities get that, right? So 
Sodom is a bad city in the Old Testament, but if Jesus had showed up there and done the things that he had been doing in Capernaum, that city would have been saved. What is that saying about this generation that Jesus is preaching to? Okay, this is not just any old generation. This is an extremely dark spiritual condition that Jesus was born into in the nation of Israel. Okay, it's unlike any other generation previous. That's the foundation. And it's important to remember that because the rest of the story is built on that. You can't forget that when Jesus now goes out and starts preaching and gets reactions from certain people groups in certain ways. You cannot forget the foundation of where he is and who he's talking to, okay? So, um, it's interesting too, because if we were to go back and read Moses' story, for example, we would start in chapter one of Exodus. We would, uh, people are in slavery, they're being oppressed. Moses grows up, he escapes into Midian. Um, he encounters God at the burning bush. I'm just reading through my notes here. He's commissioned uh, by God. Aaron is sent with him. The labors increased. We just read about the rod becomes a serpent. Remember that? Uh, the 10 plagues. Um, all of those are executed. The Passover occurs, the whole Passover story. Uh, the people leave Egypt, the Red Sea parts. The people receive the entirety of the law when, when they get to Mount Sinai. This is the Moses story, but this is a story of an exodus. The entire thing is a story of an exodus. It's not just the Red Sea that's the exodus story. It's the whole process. Moses completed an exodus of pulling people out of slavery and taking them on the way to a promised land. He wasn't able to get them in himself, but his successor was, right? Joshua. That is the whole story of the Exodus. And it's interesting, in Luke 9, at the Transfiguration, Luke 9, and behold, two men were talking with Jesus, not gonna go into great detail about what it is, hopefully you're somewhat familiar with it. Two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, so they're up on a mountain, Transfiguration, right? who were appearing in glory, were speaking of, now notice here, his departure. I don't know what your translations say there. This is the NASB. Does anybody else have a different, in, if you take time to look up Luke 9? His departure. Commentators and translators don't really know what to do with this, but the Greek word behind that departure word, can you guess what it is? Exodus. It's Exodus. Now let me restate that sentence, knowing that now. And behold, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah. Well, that's interesting. Who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his, Jesus's, exodus. We see departure, and what do we think of? When Jesus leaves and ascends to heaven. That's how I always used to read it. But it's, they were speaking of his, Jesus' exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus, his whole story. Where are we at in the process? Luke 9, we're approaching the end of Jesus' ministry, right? And they're still talking about the exodus that he is to perform. So with that in mind, this is a spiritually dark situation. Jesus is the new Moses. He is that character that God anoints for a specific purpose. And the purpose is to bring a, God's people out of a condition of slavery, offer them a new land of freedom, right? These are all New Testament terminology. He speaks God's word, right? He is the word, <laughs> just like Moses, he's a servant. He is the suffering servant out of Isaiah 53, the one that will die for the sins of the people. Okay? This is the entire story of Jesus. The rest of the gospel is an Exodus story told in terms of Jesus being the new Moses. Okay? And I know you're sitting there thinking, okay, it's time to move on because we've got chapter 3. 
But I don't want to go to chapter three until that foundation is thoroughly set in your minds because what we do normally is we compartmentalize and once we move to chapter three, we're going to start talking about other stuff and I don't want you to forget this. Does that make sense? Because this is the context to understand that. And I'll show you tonight what I mean. Matthew chapter three, let's go there. Finally, oh. Let's talk about the voice of John the Baptist, verses one through three. You had some questions regarding this. Um, I'm gonna focus uh, mainly on verse three, this quote uh, out of the Old Testament. Did anybody uh, track down where that quote came from? This, uh, the voice of one crying? Yeah, it's Isaiah 40, verse 3. Now, let's read it first. Uh, and our English versions may differ slightly, but let's read it uh, first here. And then I'm going to point out some things as we jump to Isaiah 43. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Notice there's a comma here. Make ready the way of the Lord, comma there. Make his path straight. I'm going to propose to you that the comma should be after the word crying, okay? We read it the way the commas are set, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, okay? Is he crying like we would say crying? That's kind of a nebulous term in our language. It's not a, it's not a cry like boo-hoo cry, right? This is a proclamation, a cry out, right? He's preaching, he's proclaiming, okay? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. The wilderness is the setting for where the way of the Lord should be set. Now, you say, how did you get that? Well, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40. You can turn there yourself, or you can look at the screen. I'll have it up here. Now look at this. Do you see what Isaiah 40 looks like? A voice is calling, comma. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Do you see that? Is that different? Yes. Slightly. And I'll, suppose, I'll, I'll propose a couple things. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Okay? A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord. Where? In the wilderness. It is important that the way that's cleared for the Lord is in the wilderness, according to Isaiah 40. It's a prophetic cry, it's a pronouncement that John the Baptist is making. That's important because how long has it been since prophecy has been proclaimed in Israel when John the Baptist shows up? Any ideas? 400 years. It's been 400 years since the last prophet spoke. And who was that, according to our scriptures at least? Malachi. It's the last book in the last of the Old Testament, right? It's been 400 years. And in Malachi, Malachi ends with this. This is chapter four of Malachi. I'm just gonna do a quick read through. For behold, the day is coming. I want you to, I've highlighted some things. I want you to pay attention to those because uh, I may have done that for a reason. Okay. <laughs> Burning like a furnace. The day is coming, right? Behold. This is Malachi in the uh, uh, last part of the Old Testament, okay, uh, talking about a time yet future. <clears throat> day is coming. Burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and evil doer will be chaff. Well, that's interesting. Sound familiar? Okay. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze. And the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Sound familiar? But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, a messianic term, son of righteousness, it's S-U-N, not S-O-N, but it still refers to the Messiah figure, will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses. Well, that's an interesting thing to bring up at this time. 
right as we're finishing out your book. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Interesting title, isn't it? Even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Horeb is the mountain of God, Sinai, another name. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And thus the Old Testament ends. Now, just as I read through that, what sounded familiar? Well, if you've been through that chapter three, there's a lot there, isn't it? It's almost like somebody in chapter three of Matthew was trying to allude back to Malachi chapter four, a promise that Elijah would come, right? And who says some of these things? It's John the Baptist. So 400 years of silence and John the Baptist shows up with a voice proclaiming, crying out. It breaks that 400 year of silence and right on his coattails are, is Jesus proclaiming as well, right? So this silence, goes from nothing to a crescendo very quickly in time. And it's after 400 years. Now, let me just ask you a question because I don't know if you're thinking ahead of me yet. Is there another story in the Bible where there was a period of time of 400 years without prophetic utterance? Oh, it was the generations of the people in Egypt, was it not? Now, let me ask you a question. How was that 400 years silence broken? With the birth of whom? Moses. So we have a period of 400 years in the Old Testament of prophetic silence that is broken up and uh, entered into a period of prophecy with the birth of Moses. And here we have a period of 400 years, that intertestamental period, where there's silence and Jesus is born. John the Baptist begins it, right? Yeah. The Elijah figure. And then Jesus follows directly. I'm just proposing to you that Matthew has an agenda below the surface of the story that he's telling. And it was not just assumed, but it was acknowledged by his first readership. People that read this story understood what he was doing below the surface. It's kind of like us going back to the Chronicles of Narnia as adults. When we read them as children, it was a great story, wasn't it? But when you come back and you start reading those same stories to your kids, what happens? The same story is there, but you begin to understand that what C.S. Lewis has done is written an entire story underneath a symbolic story that represents something else, right? This is something that Matthew does. This is something all the, uh, all the writers of, uh, biblical writers do. They assume you know terminology and content like that. So we had 400 years of prophetic silence. Um, what else is in the Matthew 33 quote? In the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It's in the wilderness. Remember we went back to Isaiah 40? In the wilderness, make his path straight. It's not the crying in the wilderness, but the path being straight needs to be in the wilderness. Let me ask you a question. Can you think of any story, biblical story, where people that were in the wilderness could have used a straight path. Maybe the group coming out of Egypt <laughs> who went into the wilderness had a straight path to the promised land, right? And why couldn't they get there? It was their lack of faith. It was their lack of faith that prevented them into. And it entered them into a period of 40 of loops and bends. So Luke 7, interestingly enough, Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, Malachi, that passage is used here 
as he will go, talking about John the Baptist, he will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Where's that from? That's that Malachi passage we just read, right? Interestingly enough, he defines what that means because some people might not arrive at what does that mean? Fathers back, hearts back to the children? Look at the next one. And the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This father turning the heart back to the children and children back to the father, this is a comparison. He's coming back so that disobedient people will take on this attitude of the righteous in an attempt to prepare to hear the words that Jesus will be speaking. Because Jesus is coming speaking the truth and if you have an errant heart, you're probably not going to respond to that too well. So John the Baptist's ministry is to prepare people to hear the message coming later. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's good. Okay. John's attire. We talked a little bit about the camel's hair. We went back to some Old Testament references. What would you come up with? Why is he wearing camel's hair and a leather belt? Maybe. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of the description of Elijah. I mean, Elijah was a hairy man, and he had a leather belt around his loins. Uh, maybe John the Baptist isn't so hairy. <laughs> so he puts on a camel's hair, right? <laughs> and he puts on, the, this is Halloween, almost. Um, there may be some symbolism there, too, with the type of garment he's wearing with a period of mourning. So he, as a prophet, might be mourning the condition of Israel. So that's out there as well and certainly something to be considered there. Should we be expecting Elijah to return? That is a question that some people ask coming out of this discussion. Should we today be expecting Elijah, the Old Testament character, to come in the future yet? It's a good question. I don't know if you've thought about it. I'm just going to give you a couple things to think about in a response to that. Um, in that Luke 117 passage, uh, uh, it's mentioned or talked about a little bit how um, John the Baptist is specifically tied to the ministry of Elijah that's mentioned in Malachi. Okay? This is saying that John is fulfilling this. And in Malachi, it was Elijah that was named. But here it's John that's named. So um, that's one thing. In Matthew 11:3, also, that we will get to eventually, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, that's John the Baptist. And if you are willing to accept it, these are red letters, okay? So if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come. Now, other people have different opinions, but in my opinion, um, I just go with what Jesus says, okay? No, I... <laughs> For him who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's what Jesus says, right? And so I think the way I read this, and I would encourage you to read it the same way, uh, Elijah, uh, there's a spirit of Elijah that John had in his ministry, and that is the idea of the promise of Elijah coming. One like Elijah in his spirit coming, and when John the Baptist did that, he fulfilled that idea. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, lots of other stuff to read on that. So that's not the only opinion out there. Feel free to uh, send me an email and debate. I love that. It's good. Um, let, me, uh, let me take two or three more minutes and round it out. And then we will, uh, we will lump Jesus' baptism in with... Uh, his temptation next week because I think those two things go together uh, nicely anyway. It's unfortunate chapter break there. John the Baptist's movement, what he does, it's a huge movement. There's a lot of traction with a lot of people. People coming out from Jerusalem, Judea, everybody around the uh, Jordan River. Um, a lot of people coming into that region for the religious feasts every year, three times a year. You've got a big group of people coming in. John the Baptist is preaching. He's out in the wilderness. Um, a lot of people would have been introduced to his teaching at these feasts at those times. A lot of people were baptized and then returned home 
They didn't live in Jerusalem, but they returned home. And there's actually um, some people that left in a state of repentance, having been baptized by John, that never ever heard about Jesus. How do I know that? Does anything come to mind? Well, I'm going to take you to a really weird passage in Acts chapter 19. This is Paul on his third missionary journey. This is approximately somewhere around 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. Okay? Third missionary journey. So Paul had some time away, then he started his journeys, and this is the third one. So there's a lot of time that's passed. It happened that while uh, Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Interesting. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Unfortunate translation, probably better translated. We have not heard whether the Holy Spirit is or has arrived. Okay. Uh, I've got my reasons for that, but won't take time right now. And he said... Into what then were you baptized? This is 30 years later in Ephesus, way far away from Jerusalem. Okay? And they said, into John's baptism. Not John the disciple, John the Baptist. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. That's right. Good. And telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is Jesus. First time these guys had heard it. For 30 years, they've been preaching John the Baptist's message of repentance. Is that a bad message? Is it an incomplete message once Jesus does his work? Yes. So, um, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Makes sense. Uh, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, Holy Spirit came on them, began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. This group of John the Baptist disciples. We actually have a current modern day uh, example of this. There's a guy named Hiro On Onada. He died in uh, January of 2014, so just a few years ago. Uh, he hid out in the jungle after World War I for 29 years. Didn't believe any of the messages sent to him that the war was over because he thought the enemy was sending them. Finally, they had to get his commanding officer, great Wikipedia article, by the way, if you want. Um, they had to get his commanding officer to go to where they knew he was and over a loudspeaker, tell him that he's been relieved of his duty and good job, <laughs> right? So is it possible that you've got people out there, even 30 years later, repentant? From that aspect, true believers in God, and yet hadn't heard the name of Jesus. Yeah, got a great, people don't know what to do with this, the commentators, go, go read your commentaries, it's really fun. We'll talk a bit about baptism next week, whether it's uh, uh, something that happened in Jewish, uh, uh, in the Jewish uh, tradition uh, before John shows up. Uh, I'll send you to some different places there. Um, we'll talk about, uh, obviously I, I do want to mention in Matthew 3, 7, brood of vipers. What is, what is John suggesting when he calls the Pharisees and Sadducees a brood of vipers? He is suggesting that they are the seed of Satan. And who is Jesus? Genesis 3.15, we talked about last week, he's the seed of the woman. And the showdown that was discussed way back then is about to happen. Okay, so that's interesting. And uh, we'll talk a bit about what uh, Holy Spirit and fire baptism means and how we might interpret that next week as we get into his baptism and then we'll go straight into the wilderness. I want to encourage you this week... Um, I had uh, a chance to do a sermon a little while ago about uh, one like David. It was entitled One Like David and it was uh, presenting Jesus as a king like David. And I just want to encourage you, there's a link on the Matthew study resources to that. I spent the lar a large portion of the remainder, the last part of that sermon, talking about the temptation in the wilderness, Matthew 4. I'm not going to repeat what I said in that sermon next week. 
okay? So if you want to hear uh, that, go back. It's not the whole sermon, but it's the last part of the sermon. You can look at that, listen to it, hear what I said about Matthew chapter 4 and the temptation in the wilderness. I'm going to skip over that next week and go to the calling of the disciples. So let's pray. Dear God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for a chance to open up your word. Uh, and just be reminded of what kind of a story we're reading, that this is a dramatic saving of a people in need. And thank you, because not, we weren't alive then, but we're alive now, and we have the same need. And we are so thankful that your exodus is still being accomplished, one heart at a time. Uh, be with us as we go into the world and share that message in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here.